So I'm uh, Corey Chivers. I'm a, a PhD student uh, down the road at, at McGill. Um, I study uh, there, I study uh, computational ecology. Um, and if you know what that means, uh, come and tell me at beers afterwards, because I'm dying to know. Uh, but <clears throat> but I'm not going to talk about that today. I'm going to talk about what I like to do kind of in my more spare time, evenings and weekends, um, which is competitive uh, data science um, and with using R and, R and Python. Um, so I tried to make a pretty grand title. My alternatives were from the depths of the ocean to the expanse of the cosmos, competitive data science, something like that. And the original title said competitive uh, data mining, I think. So it's not really data mining. Um, and I was going to change it to machine learning. It's not really machine learning specifically either or statistics. So I used that wonderful catch-all title that we all love now, uh, data science. So <clears throat> what's competitive data science? So it's this, uh, there's a company called Kaggle uh, in the Valley. And they, they're making data science a sport, uh, according to their, their website. And they've been around for a couple of years. And they've been getting tons of, of press. Um, that's the New York Times. Uh, I could have pulled up a, a, you know, a ton, of, ton of articles about them. Um, they're really huge. Um, but, but what do they do? So what they do is they host um, challenges, data challenges, uh, online. And anybody can, can take their best shot at them. They, they post up the data. They post a well-defined um, performance metric of, uh, the, of what your solution is to a, to a given problem. And everybody just takes their stab at it. And whoever gets the best score uh, wins. And it turns out. Uh, Doing these things is kind of like crack. Like it's really, really addictive. Um, and so I, I sunk a lot of hours into doing these, these contests. So I'll just get uh, started with a bit of the toolkit that one would use um, if they're going to try to get into this competitive data science world. So not surprisingly, given the title, uh, I, I, I use R a lot in my academic work as an ecologist. Ecologists are huge on R. Um, but also Python is, uh, is um, increasingly becoming used for, for uh, numerical analysis. Uh, and I mean, some would argue for a long time. But people are, in ecology are starting to recognize that as well. Um, but that's, of course, a simplified view of, of the toolkit. Obviously, it's, it's, much, it's, much, more, uh, it's much bigger than that. Um, you've got all kinds of awesome uh, Python modules. And actually, it uh, stats models, I think, was in there. But it must have got erased. Uh, it, it, it was in there uh, before. <laughs> uh, and um, you know, so you're going to use all kinds of tools, not just R and Python. Um, Octave there is the open source version of MATLAB, uh, C++, C++ if you really need to do some computationally intensive simulations. Um, but not so much in the competitive data science world, where you're given a very well-structured problem with very clean data. But in kind of the more data science more broadly, of course, your toolkit's going to also include um, things for wrangling and munging that data, um, like sed, grep, and awk, uh, which are favorite go-tos. And then, of course, you can't talk about data science without putting up the friendly elephant and mention Hadoop. Um, none of the data uh, that you'll encounter on, on Kaggle uh, is of the scale that you would need to use Hadoop. Um, but I put it there anyways for completeness. Uh, so let's just launch right into one, the, one of the challenges. So um, Cornell University, in uh, collaboration with some other, uh, some other scientists, uh, have dispatched this big network of um, buoys in high traffic uh, areas, high um, uh, ocean traffic areas uh, that are um, uh, uh, routes of ships. I don't know why I'm struggling with that. So, uh, and, and the idea is that they're trying to limit the amount of collisions between whales and these ships. Um, and so they want to be able to identify when is a whale kind of in the vicinity of one of these buoys. And the, the buoys have these underwater uh, microphones. Um, so the problem is one of, of, of signal processing of that uh, audio information. And then, and then it's a classification problem. It's the question is, is there a whale or is there not a whale? Um, so I thought I would just show kind of some of the highlights of, of this kind of analysis, um, or this, like how you would run through this kind of thing. So oh my we're going to find the whales, because these are in your oceans. Thanks <laughs> <laughs> so much. <laughs> Uh, so some of the, some of the uh, important modules are um, this Scikits uh, audio lab. This is going to allow us to, uh, to read in these uh, audio files. So they're little two-second clips of audio from these underwater microphones. Um, and they mostly just sound like, <laughs> like There's mostly nothing. Um, but actually, the whale kind of goes whoop. It's very subtle, but it's in there. And you can hear it in some of them. But there's, they, they provide you with something like 30,000 of these. Um, two-second audio files. So we're, we don't want to just listen to them. We want to actually 
come up with an algorithm to classify them. Uh, so that's going to help us read those in. And then, of course, you, know, you can't go to bed feeling good about yourself until you've done some fast Fourier transforms. So we bring in uh, FFT pack from SciPy. Um, and then this module is, is just so we can get our, give ourselves some motivation to get started. Oh, no, I'm not online. Oh, I had a cute little picture of a whale there. He was telling us to take a breath. So just imagine it. Uh, you have to. Oh. Oh, so that's right. And there we go. I thought that uh, everything was still in the kernel. There we go. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, OK. So yeah, that's very good advice you know, before you start any one of these you know, data problems. Take a deep breath. Uh, and then we're just going to load in the, the, the labels. So, so it's a supervised learning problem, uh, meaning that you have some examples that are labeled, uh, that there either is a whale or there's not a whale. Um, and then you're meant to create an algorithm that can learn from those training uh, uh, cases and create a, a prediction uh, when, they, uh, when it experiences a, a novel case. So we're going to just read in the, the labels. That, I guess, was read in here because it's uh, 30,000 uh, long. Um, and then we'll just have a look at uh, what this data looks like. So I mentioned it's, it's, it's audio information. Um, but audio information is really difficult to do data analysis on on its own. So we need to kind of massage that into some other form. And we're gonna, that's what we're going to use. The Fourier transform is, is going to give us a, a spectrogram of, the, uh, of these audio files. So we'll just read in you know, 10 of them just to, just to have a look. This is called spectrogram. So this is just in time on the x-axis. And, and on the y-axis, is um, uh, pa it's a power uh, spectrum. Uh, across frequencies. So this is going up in frequency on this axis, and, and you just have a heat kind of map of, of the power at those different frequencies. Um, so it turns a, a, an audio uh, a piece of a piece of audio data into now what is essentially an image, um, and then we can do we can use all the techniques we have for um, image recognition uh, to to answer this problem. Um, so I've also just plotted here whether whether there was a whale or not. So we just have a look and say, oh, that, that's, that's one that just sounds like what I, how I described, a little garbled nonsense. There's some more garbled nonsense, underwater noises. It's like you know, you're know supposed to listen to it as you're going to sleep. It's really soothing. Not present, not present, OK. I wonder if any of those, these are present. I think one of them is. Not present, more garbage. There's one, OK. So can anyone see the whale call in there? Yeah. yeah. OK, awesome, right? Obviously, it just stands, it just sticks right out of you, right? So, so let's actually, let's, instead of just looking at them one at a time, what I did is I just compiled all the positives so we could start, start to get a visual idea of what does a whale call look like. Uh, so hopefully that'll work, yeah. So there's all, all the whale calls. So now can you see the, the whale call? So these are just positive cases. These are ones that have a, a blue whale in them. I don't know if you can see it, but it's this, it's this little hook here. So that's the whoop. So it's, so it's going up, up in frequency over this little kind of, this is two seconds total, so that's over about you know, a little under a second. Whoop. So that's there. That's, that's what they look like. Uh, so that's cool. So that gets us somewhere. OK. So, it, so <clears throat> actually, that was pretty useful for me when I was actually doing this, this challenge to realize that it's, it's all concentrated in this region. I actually trimmed everything else out of these spectrograms and only focused on that, this one region, because all of this other stuff is noise. It's not really going to give us any information. It's like if we were looking for a face. You just, you know, you'd try to eliminate everything that's not where the face is likely to be. Um, and then let's just go ahead and, and, and fit, fit a model to it. So scikit-learn has all kinds of uh, the, the standard um, classifier algorithms. Uh, here we're going to just import support vector machines. Uh, maybe you've heard of some of these support vector machines, like artificial neural networks, um, these kinds of things. They're, they're, they're ways to uh, learn from, from uh, labeled data. So let's just import that. Um, and then here, this is just I've taken the, the training data that I, that I cleaned up a little bit. And I just put it all together into one flat data file. Um, and, and we're going to read that in. And hopefully. Hopefully, I don't have to retrain re this because it kind of is, is slow. But so you can just, it's really straightforward to train one of these classifiers. Um, you, just, you just kind of define it. You give it your input. So this is the, the, the whale call pictures 
pictures of the whale calls. This is the labels, whether it's there or not, ones and zeros. And it's going to just go ahead and, and, and fit a support vector machine on that. Um, and hopefully, I'm going to try not running that again and see, see if that'll work. Um, and then we're going to just validate that. So I ran that just on a subsample of the data, just the first 5,000, just, just to make it sort of doable. Uh, and then we're just going to validate and see, OK, so we, we, we just took 5,000 of those labeled data. And we're going to now see if, how well we can predict some other 1,000, uh, some completely unique now new that the, the model hasn't seen uh, set, uh, cases. And we're going to go ahead and predict those as probabilities. And then um, the, the performance metric that was used in this contest is one that's fairly common for binary classification models. It's the area under the receiver operator curve. Um, and it basically just gives you an idea of uh, your relative rates of false positives and false negatives. And you want it to be 1. You want it to be as close to 1 as possible. An ROC, or an ROC of 0.5 is you're doing no better than random. So uh, let's see how we do. Somewhere between 0.5 and, and 1. Uh, OK, so I would have had to train that, unfortunately. Let's, uh, let's run that for now, and maybe we'll come back to it. OK? But the punchline there is, so that, uh, the Cornell University's state of the art at the time that they posted this challenge was an AUC of 0.745 or so. Um, uh, and that, that's how well they were able to classify these audio files. And within a couple of days of this challenge going up, well, I was about to show that I was able to get, by fitting on even a subset sample of the data, in the 7.5 region, so at the state-of-the-art level, using this very simple uh, case. Um, but within a couple of days, there were other people who had models that were you know, AUCs of 0.99. Like, they were just, it was ridiculous. I don't know. Like, all these, you know, point dexters at Cornell couldn't, <laughs> couldn't come close to all these other point dexters who uh, <laughs> participated in the Kegel competition. Um, OK, so that was cool. So it would have been cooler if we could have seen that, but alas. So that was a neat one, and I, and I had fun kind of playing with it. And, and you have Scikit-Learn has all the, the tools. I, I tried also an artificial neural network and some other built-in kind of uh, classifier models. Um, but there are also contests up there that don't really conform to this like really uh, sort of standard case of, of, uh, of classification or like k-nearest neighbors or something like that. Um, and that was this contest. Uh, so that was the, the object of this contest was to uh, map the dark matter in the universe. It was very, um, uh, you know, not very ambitious. Uh, so I thought I would give it a try, and it turned out so it's the winner would have got twenty thousand dollars. So th so participating in these uh, contests is kind of like crack, but I mean, if you had a one, you could actually buy like a lot of actual crack, um, <laughs> if if you so desired. Um, <laughs> But so, so, so dark matter is, is kind of cool. So dark matter is dark, so we can't see it. Um, but what we can see is its effect that it has on, on the very fabric of space-time uh, itself, which is uh, just awesome. Um, and so uh, it turns out that, that while you don't see the dark matter, you, you can see uh, it, it has effects on what you see behind the dark matter. So it actually, there's a phenomenon called gravitational lensing, and that's going to distort background galaxies that we look at um, through our telescopes. Uh, so, so what you get from, the, from this contest was, uh, uh, let's go up here. So you get a bunch of, a bunch of skies, um, and they've just coded them uh, as, uh, let's do this. So they've just coded them as uh, uh, galaxy locations, and then they've abstracted all of the uh, you know, idiosyncrasies of different galaxies it just in terms of into just their uh, ellipticities. So that's just their, their confirmation in the sky, what, you know, kind of how they're oriented and how elongated they are in the sky. And, uh, and, and you, get, you get all that, that data. And then you get some, some <coughs> cases where the, the location of the dark matter is known um, by other means. Uh, so that's cool. It's kind of hard to see anything in that. But so we can have a look. So here I use R to, to take that data and actually plot it with the, uh, with the dark matter in there. So this is one of the training skies. Cool. Uh, and there are two dark matter halos here. And so in the absence of any kind of foregrounding dark matter, you would expect the, the configuration of these galaxies to be at random. They would just be oriented random everywhere. Um, but what happens is the, the, the lensing effect of the, of the foreground 
dark matter skews slightly skews what we what we see as the uh, ellipticity of the galaxies that are in the background. So it's actually really hard to see in this in this case. Those are pretty edge cases. So you can sort of start to see it here. So it's having this kind of this kind of effect where it's just sort of skewing from the random the otherwise random configuration of background galaxies, um, and that's the information on which you're you're meant to then uh, not knowing where this is. Try to try to build a, an algorithm that which will uh, guess where they are. Uh, so there's another one. That's also not that strong. That, you can kind of see this the effect of this one. So this is a really cool problem because it does not conform at all to like you can't just throw it into like you know a support vector machine or something like that and just you know la di da and you go. Uh, so you actually have to build a model of of how you think the the system is working of the process. So <clears throat> a little bit of Wikipediaing. Um, uh, and I discovered that, uh, that this, these lenses follow, one of the proposed distributions is this er Ernesto profile. Um, and it's just this functional form, um, which actually causes, induces this skew on the galaxies surrounding uh, the dark matter. So I built up the model uh, to, to, to simulate how that would affect um, the galaxies as the, the mass of that foregrounding dark matter increases. So you can start to see on the left, Right now you're getting this full full skew, whoops, full skew, and now you now you've got this full lensing effect surrounding this very very massive uh, dark dark matter halo. And so then <clears throat> the idea is okay. So I have this model which uh, simulates it. So then the 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 the, the uh, solution to locating the the dark matter is to simply fit this functional form to the skies in the test set. Um, and so what I did, it was that, and this is just kind of a, a heat map of, of the, the locations of better fit of this, um, this ellipticity component. So this is just, as this increases, that's the tangential ellipticity component. So if you imagine a, a line going out there and a tangent, these are all aligned along the tangent. Uh, so this is kind of a map of that for one of the training skies. And there's where my algorithm picks where the, the halo is, and there's where it actually is. Uh, there's another one. So it does pretty, pretty kick-ass. I was really excited when I did this. Um, but that turns out that's for the one halo sky situation. And in skies, like I showed you in the uh, examples, they often have more than one halo. And those lenses interact in complex ways. And it becomes very difficult. So, so I'm showing you like the really good results. But when, when you have more than one halo, it's hard to fit these simultaneously. Um, but try I did. Um, and in the end, I was a little bit late. But actually, I'm kind of proud of this. Uh, I, I ended up in the top 10 from my last entry that w came in a little bit. Thank you. <laughs> so I didn't bring home the 20 grand, but, but it was cool. And it was super fun uh, to do. Um, and so I just want to end with uh, a, a quote from Tukey. So the best thing about being a statistician. So like I said, I'm a computational ecologist. And what am I doing uh, in the cosmos? Um, well, the point is you can apply you know, your, your quantitative reasoning to a lot of different fields. So it's great to be a statistician because you can play in everyone's backyard. But of course, nobody says statistician anymore, right? We're all data sciences. <laughs> so that's you know, the updated quote from Tukey. And then just finally, I'd like to just rep this uh, 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 Montreal R users groups that I uh, co-run with this guy, Etienne. He's a colleague of mine at McGill. Um, and we have a meetup group that's similar to, to to the kind of, it's kind of similar to the project nights of uh, Montreal Python, but we look at R. Um, so if you're interested in checking that stuff out, come on out and see us.